actually know my grandfather. That's so cool. Slack this. You got, uh, can you give it to Chuck? Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, Slactus. So it is a really small world. Good morning, mystery person. All right, I'm co-hosting, got it. So I'm just, just heading out now. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Penny. Yeah, you're, uh, I think you're going to kind of have to take over here. All right. Which Sounds I'm, good. yeah, you got it. You got it. How did it, so it, it sounded like uh, the the stream was not very successful today. No, uh, very jerky. Why? Ugh. Yeah. Too and bad. I, I don't know. And I don't I'm know not, what it is I wasn't the jerky. digital. I, it, it's got. I wasn't that jerky, was I? No, no, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was kidding. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, no, yeah, it Phil was, is, it was I think Phil is frustrating. You, yeah. Yeah, you were saying stuff, and then you'd like and be like, "Oh my god." <laughs> so, yeah, I don't yeah, know. I mean, the was... the video was awesome with the digital, but the digital does not has not been streaming fluid yeah yeah and i yeah we're i think it's it really does mean we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board again so we'll figure it out but okay uh, i gotta grab question. this just a minute hello okay I, I said it's the same as last week. It's a, it's the same every week. Okay. Um, are you on the? And I also sent it out to adult form last night, in an email. Okay, I'll 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 send it to you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm back. Evidently, um, the Zoom link might not have been in the um, the this week at Trinity thing or something. Oh, really? I, don't know. I had a couple of people ask me about it, and I'm like. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's the same every week. And that's what I told her. And But I'm sure that they're just used to pulling it from the most recent one. Yeah. So maybe they, I, yeah, they just yeah, go back. I, I oftentimes will, you know, tell, tell people that, you know, it's the same each time. Oh, I don't want to do this. So let me... So I will do um, adult form next week. I'll start off. Okay. No, it's since I oh, have that's the weird. Time, since I've had the time to look at all of it in detail. And then Pastor Chris is going to do the ninth. And then I'll have you do the last two, if that sounds all right. Yep. That'd be we'll, fine. Okay. And we'll just have to. Um... Yeah, Sheila, it just, I just, so it just said that Sheila joined another meeting that another my personal meeting so i don't 
Let me see. She was she the one who called you? Yeah. Sheila was okay. And I just I just finally emailed her. Okay. The, the so hopefully thing. she'll okay. Yeah. So hopefully she sent Greg the right one. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm worried about. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see here what I can find. Yeah, and I dropped off the stuff to Pastor Chris yesterday at her house. So, um, oh, nice. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll just have to get the DVD from her. You have a way yeah. of, of playing the DVDs, right? Yeah, you know what I might do too is have Monty digitize that. I might have him digitize if I can. Oh, um, yeah. That might be Either easier. That would be a lot that might easier. Be easier. Yep. Yeah. To play it like from a, to play it from our private YouTube channel or something. Yeah, because Chris yeah. Um, said, "Oh, I don't know if I have a DVD player." She said, "I'll have to figure out something." I'm like, "I'll I'll talk to her about digitizing it." Okay, great. Yeah. So what I caught of your your message was really nice this morning yeah. <laughs> but i think i'm gonna listen to it again <laughs> yeah chris really liked it but it was, yeah and i tried to do a little the i used the drive-in honking as yes. the i just want to be a sheep ba 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 yep so they did a lot of honking out there too uh, yeah it was a hard it was actually way hard it's like a lot harder of a sermon uh than I realized, I think, to preach, which, you know, it's, it's always, you know, the word that you need to hear. And that's that, you know, that's usually my, my preaching mantra always is, you know, it's, it's the word that I need to hear, which is likely the word that other folks are going to need to hear too. So. Yep. Yeah. Oh, here she is again. Hang on. Hello. Yeah. Something's not right. So I emailed it to you. Oh, okay. Let me try again. No, no. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that he he's has the right link. So, because you sent it to him, right? Okay, because Pastor Peter saw you trying to to sign on to a different a different one. So I don't okay. Hang on. I'll have to go off my phone and try sending it to you again. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Oh. <laughs> Not okay. good. She no, she didn't get it. Huh. That's so weird. Okay, let me. Okay, so Greg says he doesn't have the link either. Okay. Oh, Miner just came. Yeah, so she's in. Huh. Jeff is Jeff is still around. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So where did it go? So, oh, so you don't have Sheila there yet. Mm -mm. Okay. Unfortunately not. Shoot. Every time I keep trying to copy it, it keeps sending me to the oh. meeting. Oh yeah.
Okay. 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 All right. I just sent it off to both of them again. So <laughs> you guys are, are welcome to unmute and, and visit if you want. We, we had a few technical difficulties here. That never happens with Trinity technology. No, no. Well, and this isn't even Trinity's technology. This is Penny and no. others. <laughs> and there are no trained people in technology here. <laughs> you know how that goes, right, Jeff? I do. Okay, here comes Greg. Good. There they go. There we go. Okay. Good. Greg, I'm so sorry about the mix up here, but I'm glad you're here. And you're still muted, so feel free to unmute. Thank you. I thought I had the link, but I did not have the link, so I appreciate you getting that to me. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we have multiple links for different activities at Trinity, and maybe Sheila ended up with a different one than what we were hoping for. So, but glad to have you here today. Yeah, and we awesome. usually start, you know, a little bit after 11 just waiting for people to get get on and, and stuff so we have a few more minutes so okay good um good. i'm glad i didn't keep you waiting oh no no we're a very flexible crowd good deal <laughs> appreciate it so greg i know your mother i bet you everybody knows your mother oh, huh? yeah exactly you're not the first person to say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep yeah. my mom's pretty involved in still water too so. yeah yeah how do you know her sheila uh, from uh, from DFL stuff and mm -hmm. you know women's women's political stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm glad. So, I appreciate you thinking of me to invite me today. So. Well, I'm. I just. I. I really. Lo I look forward to getting the the your magazine and and it's so interesting. Good. You know, it's just like it's it's sustainability and controversy and history and just the beauty of the river you know yep. the wonderfulness of the river yep. yeah i don't want to give away too much of my talk but i, I the, the thing i love about the river is sort of how multifaceted it is you know there's there's yeah. just so much to it there's the nature yeah. and the history and the conservation and everything yeah. I'm, I'm glad you enjoy the newsletter i will give a nice little plug for 360 at the end don't worry okay yeah we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. Get everybody signed up hopefully yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, I, I'm surprised it's not better known. I know. And, and I will do my part to let people know about it. So you invited me here today. I appreciate that. Yeah. That's a great yeah. way to do it. We're I friends with Ryan Cochran. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How uh, the Andersons. How do you guys know him? Um, our daughter, Jennifer Anderson and Ryan played together when they were little. Oh, no way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we followed your career and we get your Oh. <laughs> every oh. time you send them on the river so oh wonderful yeah, yeah ryan's one of my oldest friends so yeah yeah he's a good guy i'm gonna give people just another minute or two i know that there were some others that had reached out to me yesterday with questions so i'm hopeful oh. that the, yeah and we have some people we just so you know greg we mm -hmm. we do our our online church service at 8.30 in the morning. And then we have a drive-in oh, yeah. outdoor experience over um, in Holton yeah. at the old drive-in theater there. And so a lot of times people are there at 10 mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. it doesn't run a whole hour, but they'll come in late sometimes. So I'll kind of watch for that sure. too. And, and we also record this. I'm hoping that's okay with you. That's fine with me. That I was thinking that that would be nice. That way, I can go back and critique myself afterwards. So, and it's also nice <laughs> because people will people will watch it later. Those that can't come in when we're we're doing it um, online and stuff right now. So, um, so we have a lot of a lot of different options for people to to see this as well. That's great. Okay. Well, um, I'll just keep watching for people. As always, welcome everyone.
for coming to Adult Forum this morning. And um, I, as always, um, when Greg is doing his presentation today, I'll have people on mute and I will watch you for wave of hands or you can put stuff in the chat if you have questions. And um, so I'll kind of help monitor that so you don't need to do that, Greg. Okay. And um, let's see, what else? Anything else? So anyway, but we are thrilled to have Greg here today. And I will let Sheila, who is the, um, the one of the green team people here at Trinity, who got Greg to join us today and enlighten us. And I'll have Sheila do the introduction. So then we'll be all set. So take it away, Sheila. So uh, Greg is a still water person. And um, he lives in, in May Township with his family. And he describes himself as a writer and a river bum. And he started uh, St. Croix 360 in 2011. I, I've only been on it for like a year. So I'm sorry I missed those yeah. years. But, and the goal is to uh, uh, share river stories to inspire stewardship. I think that's the goal. Yeah. So you can read every week. You can read about environmental threats. You can read about municipal planning, um, you know, the thing about the, the large containment farms is a hot issue like north of us along the St. Croix. Um, and every, every week there's a, a update on phrenology from Afton State Park, you know, what birds are there, what, it's just like wonderful. And then um, Greg gets out on the river regularly and just writes these beautiful essays about what he sees and what he feels being on the river. And then he also has history, the history. And a couple of weeks ago, there was this really interesting story about these two sisters who ran a ferry north of us in the 1930s. Like who knew? That was a great story. Um, anyway, so I'm, I just really enjoy the three, St. Croix 360 and I hope many more people will uh, jump on, jump on it. So thank you for coming, Greg. Oh yeah, no, my pleasure and thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I think Sheila pretty much covered it. Um, I did start St. Croix 360 about 10 years ago. And, um, you know, Sheila's not the only one to just kind of learn about it. It's just been a sort of slow growth over that time. And there's always new people I, uh, coming to it. So um, I'm just, you know, glad to be able to talk to you folks today. I hope you will sign up for 360. Like uh, Sheila was saying, there's a weekly email newsletter that goes out every Friday with links to the latest articles and things like that. Um, so I have a presentation today. Um, I promise it'll be mostly just pretty pictures. Um, I, I, I have to warn you, there are a few charts of some data, but uh, we'll try to keep that to a minimum. And, um, and I'm just going to talk about the St. Croix, why I love it, um, a little bit of its history and, and protection, and um, some of the ongoing uh, threats and issues facing it, and what people are doing to uh, help protect it. And I will give a little overview of, of 362 at the, uh, at the end. So I'm going to just get my presentation started here. Do I need to do anything particular? Am I this presenter now, so? You've been set co-host, so you should be able to share. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Or uh, no? Oh, hold on a second. No, of course not, just a second. Uh, Can we see that? Yep, looks okay. good. Good. Um, so there is our beautiful St. Croix River. Um, I believe that was a morning shot. Uh, that's actually one of my favorite times. If you haven't been out on the river nice and early in the morning, it's, uh, I think it's one of the best times to be out there. You get the bird chorus and just the sort of start of the day and beautiful lighting and all that. So um, I, I like, uh, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do. I'm looking forward to doing this summer, especially. Um, and as you are probably aware, the St. Croix is protected as a wild and scenic river um, by the federal government. That uh, was protected uh, as part of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act when it was passed in 1968, just 52 years ago. Um, and we will talk a little bit more about that history as well. Here is just a very basic map of the St. Croix River and its watershed. Um, so the St. Croix is about just under 200 miles long, um, and it drains an area um, of about 7,700 square miles. Um, I think it's about the same size as the state of New Jersey for reference, 
Um, and of course, it's, uh, it's in two states, Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, I'll give you a little bit more of a reference here. This kind of shows some of the major towns in the watershed. Um, and of course, Stillwater is not showing up for some reason, but uh, we all know where that is. Um, but uh, that just kind of gives you a little bit better of an idea. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a very large area that drains towards the river. And you know, I think that's really important. Um, I think as we've learned, uh, a lot of folks have kind of started to learn is that the river is one thing, but it really represents everything that happens in the watershed. And it's only as healthy as the, what's happening near its other tributaries. Um, so a watershed, of course, being the area of land that all flows, you know, the water all flows toward the same spot um, in, the, in the same water body. So that would be the St. Croix. Um, and so it has several large tributaries. And again, this shows just so it's just the this shows just the shows just the larger. Oh, I'm hearing echo. Is that just me? Yeah, I'm gonna mute a couple other okay, people I here. I, I thought it was just on my end. Um, no, yes, go this, ahead. This shows just sort of how the how the Saint Croix watershed is broken up into the major tributaries and and sort of sub basins. So the Snake River and the Kettle River are probably the two largest um, tributaries in Minnesota. Uh, the Sunrise River near North Branch is another uh, large one. Um, and also in the Minnesota side, you have like the Tamarack River. Um, and then on the Wisconsin side, there is, uh, there's the Apple River, the Willow River, the Kinnickinnick River, um, down to kind of this area. And then a little farther north, you get into the Clam and Wood Rivers, um, and the Yellow River. And then its, its largest tributary is the Namakagan. Um, the Namakagan is a special river too. It is protected as part of the St. Croix River um, National Scenic Riverway. Um, so it's all part of the, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act protected the Namakagan and the St. Croix. Uh, the the Namakagan is about 100 miles long as well. Um, awesome river for uh, kayaking, especially. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, so that just kind of gives you a little bit of the, the lay of the land, as it were. Um, now, oops. I was just recently up at the very headwaters of the St. Croix River, and there it is. Uh, can you see the video? Good. Um, yes, I'm seeing nodding. That's what. I, <laughs> that's good. Uh, that's yeah. So that's the little bubbling spring where the St. Croix River begins its journey south. Um, I think it's pretty amazing that it starts like that. This is also right in that same area. Um, it starts in this beautiful cedar, white cedar bog, um, up by Solon Springs, Wisconsin. Um, if anybody knows where that is. Um, and what's very interesting about it is that it actually starts almost from the exact same place where the Brule River starts. If you've heard of the Brule, oh, yeah. it flows into the Lake Superior um, it, it, in Wisconsin. Um, but they actually rise from the same bog, basically. And uh, the Brule goes north and the St. Croix goes south. Um, the, uh, it's, and then there's a portage trail, about a two-mile trail that connects the two water bodies that was used historically a lot by Native Americans and then by early explorers. Um, and it's just been a very important kind of highway because it connects Lake Superior essentially to the Mississippi River. Um, and then here's where it ends. Here's the, the end of the St. Croix. It's a little bit larger down there. Um, this is down by Prescott or Point Douglas. And this is an aerial view showing where the St. Croix joins the Mississippi River. Um, wow. You can see the St. Croix is blue and beautiful. The Mississippi is brown and muddy, the big muddy as they call it. Um, I have to stick up for the Mississippi here a little bit because the reason it's so uh, brown and muddy there is really because the Minnesota River joins it just a few miles above this point. And the Minnesota River drains uh, southern Minnesota primarily. It's very erosive and uh, carries a lot of sand and sediment. And then it dumps that into the Mississippi. Um, so the Mississippi above that is, is kind of like St. Croix, um, fairly clean and clear. Um, but anyway, when the St. Croix joins the Mississippi, it actually makes the Mississippi cleaner. <laughs> um, it sort of dilutes all the sediment and, and nutrients that are being carried and actually improves the Mississippi for a little ways. Um, okay, so as I was mentioning, we'll kind of talk a little bit about the history of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act um, and the protection of the river. Um, so, Going way back, back in about the early uh, 20th century in the 1900s, 
Um, somebody actually thought they would uh, dig a canal to connect the St. Croix and Brule rivers so you could have navigable boat traffic between Lake Superior and the Mississippi River. Um, thankfully that didn't happen, um, but that was sort of one of the initial uh, things that uh, kind of caused some of the first conservation efforts around the river. Um, and then uh, in the 1960s, um, there uh, really kind of first the uh, Excel or Northern States Power at the time uh, proposed the new power plant in Bayport in uh, about 1964. And there was a lot of opposition to it. Um, and at the same time, of course, there was a sort of growing environmental movement and uh, concern about pollution of rivers. Um, and so that plant did get built, but essentially one of the concessions, one of the sort of the other side of that was that Northern States Power um, donated uh, more than 30,000 acres of land. Um, I, I wish I knew that figure off the top of my head. A lot of, they owned a lot of the land along the upper St. Croix River, basically above St. Croix Falls, because they thought at some point they might want to build a dam up there, um, flood that area. And, and there were proposals to dam, put large hydroelectric dams up there. Um, and really, so out of that context came this movement to protect the St. Croix River, and it joined up with efforts to protect rivers around uh, the United States. And eventually came to be passed in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Um, the late uh, Walter Mondale, who just passed away this week, of course, um, as senator, was very instrumental in passing the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, and he, uh, he um, really helped push it forward. Um, along with, uh, from the Wisconsin side of the river, a Gaylord Nelson. Um, and by the way, happy belated Earth Day. I was going to start by saying that. Gaylord Nelson is, is considered the father of Earth Day. It was sort of his idea. Now, of course, he wanted to call it the Environment Teaching Day. Um, and luckily, he worked with a marketing agency to come up with a much better, catchier Earth Day. Um, but Gaylord Nelson grew up just across the river, essentially, in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. Um, it's about 20 miles east of Stillwater, um, and it's near the Willow River, which flows into the St. Croix. And uh, Gaylord Nelson spent his youth exploring the region and especially also paddling the Namakagan River um, and the St. Croix, but going to northern Wisconsin and, and paddling and, and exploring really an outdoors kind of childhood. And uh, he grew up to be a very strong conservationist, uh, really did a lot in Wisconsin before joining the U.S. Senate, and then really was an advocate for the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and including protection of the, the St. Croix and Namakagan. Um, so really Mondale and Nelson uh, from Minnesota and Wisconsin really were instrumental to passing that important legislation. And when it was passed, there were eight rivers protected in the uh, initial, um, it's grown a lot now. There are a lot, many more wild and scenic rivers. But there were the, the original eight, and the St. Croix and Namakagan were included in that original eight. Um, and really the only rivers, one of the few wild and scenic rivers not kind of in the western United States where most of them are. This, uh, yeah, the, as you can see, I've got this fun old, uh, this was a special section in the Star Tribune at the time, the Minneapolis Tribune at the time, back in the 60s. Um, and I, I got to dig through some records at the, uh, um, National Park Service headquarters in St. Croix Falls a couple of years ago that all came from Northern States Power originally. They sort of found these boxes of archives um, in their office in Denver, I believe, um, and donated them to the National Park Service. So they're all being held up there now and they have a lot of great historical documents. Um, here you can kind of see a little bit of the lobbying effort to create the National Scenic Riverway. Um, here's Jim Kimball's column about what's happening. This was what was happening with the uh, effort to protect the, the river. Another kind of special section all de dedicated to the St. Croix in this one, I think. Well, that's in the Pioneer Press. Yeah. That was right in 68. So that's a little bit of the history. There's, there's wonderful history, of course. Uh, lots more to talk about with its protection. Um, it was a long effort, took a lot of people, um, including locally, of course. Um, uh, I just saw, uh, so Gaylord Nelson's daughter, Tia, still lives in Wisconsin, and she's a conservationist in her own right. And when Walter Mondale passed away, she said, uh, Mondale, she, she loved him dearly, she said, and he was a wonderful man. And um, she, sa he, uh, she said that he told her that his joke was always that her father, Gaylord Nelson, tricked Mondale into supporting the legislation because all the opposition was in Minnesota. Um, and so Mondale kind of signed on and uh, discovered that he had his work cut out for him. Um, but he also said it was the greatest accomplishment of his life and he was always proud. 
of what he did. And that's saying something because Walter Mondale, of course, accomplished a lot in his life. Now we're gonna talk a little bit just about the awesome river. And this is probably what I like talking about the most is just how amazing it is. Um, one thing that I've found in part of my work is to experience the river ever, all throughout the year. Um, I think a lot of folks, we enjoy it during the summer. I know I sure do, um, but it's really every day up there is different. It has different things to uh, show you and um, really different kinds of beauty and wildlife every season. So we, I thought I'd just show some pretty photos. This of course being spring on the river. Um, this was actually on the solstice during a big flood, um, very high water, but uh, there's a sunrise. I mentioned I love going out at, um, at sunrise to see the river wake up. Um, of course, a beautiful summer day, this is down in Hudson with the hot air balloons we all love to see. This is autumn on the river, of course, I think stunning colors at times on the banks and even winter um, has, its, has its moments. I, I think the thing about winter I find out there is that you get the greatest amount of solitude and silence, which I love. So um, although you can, the swimming's not very good, um, you can um, just get really get experience the river all by yourself uh, in the winter. Um, this is uh, the, one of my favorite views, this north of Stillwater, uh, up by the Arcola Bluffs day use area. If you haven't been up there, just off Arcola Trail. Um, and something I, uh, really interesting about the St. Croix and its uh, nearly 8,000 square miles that it drains um, are that it sort of um, is where three major um, biological areas of the United States cross. Um, in the St. Croix watershed, there is sort of the northern forest, like you might find up in northern Minnesota by the boundary waters as well with the sort of boreal forest. Um, and so that's sort of that northern ecosystem. There's a loon, uh, of course, an iconic species. Um, then, uh, but it also sort of is on the edge of this east meets west. And so you get the western species of the prairies and the Great Plains and parts of the watershed and you get the eastern sort of forested woodland species of, um, of wildlife. And so that makes it really interesting to me as well, of course, because it's not just one sort of big um, homogenous ecosystem at all. It's um, it, the river connects a lot of different, um, very different areas. And then I, 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 can't, uh, I can't stop talking about all the wildlife out there. Um, this is one of my favorite birds. It's called the prothonotary warbler. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. Um, that's actually named for an office in the uh, um, in an ancient uh, religion, I believe, the prothonotary, but they wore bright yellow robes. Um, but anyway, this is a warbler species that um, only nests in floodplain areas. And so that's uh, the big flat forests where the river floods. Um, they, they nest in these tree cavities. As you can see, this one is, um, I think, preparing its nest on this day. Um, and uh, this is about as far north as they nest. They, uh, they really, because they have to have that floodplain float forest and really it's just kind of the lower reaches of the St. Croix where you find that. So this is kind of the northern edge of their range where they, they nest throughout the east and south, especially um, wherever there's floodplain. A little baby snapping turtle. Um, saw this on a beach one day. Thought he was about the cutest little uh, fellow I've ever seen. Um, there's a beautiful great blue heron. Uh, there are a couple of rookeries on the river that uh, you may be aware of where the uh, herons nest. Um, and that's always a really cool experience. They're often on an island. They nest in big communities up in the treetops. And especially if you can paddle right underneath, it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, I'm curious if anybody knows what this might be. But it is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to get off mute. So I'll just say it's a, it's a dragonfly. Um, so you might be well uh, familiar with dragonflies that buzz through the air during the summer. Um, and I, they're some of my favorite creatures as well. I think they're really incredible. But this is how they start their lives. Um, they actually, they're, they're, they live most of their lives underwater. Um, they're, they're laid as eggs in water. And then they spend anywhere from one to three years um, as aquatic insects. They're actually fierce predators underwater as well. They eat all kinds of larvae and um, little tiny insects and things like that. Um, and then only in the final stage of their life do they climb out of the water, usually on a stalk of grass or on the bank. And over a little course of time, they emerge from this and turn into an adult flying dragonfly, which is really just for uh, reproduction and breeding. Um, and then that's kind of the end of their life. 
this is what they look like. I couldn't remember if I had this in here. This is a dragonfly emerging from its, um, its exoskeleton um, and becoming an adult dragonfly that'll, that'll fly away. This was right on the banks of the river um, one day. And uh, they, this was happening all over that day. It was really amazing. They were all, it was like one day when they all, a whole bunch of different species were, were hatching. And then of course, this is what they look like as uh, grown-ups. Um, the St. Croix has an amazing community of dragonflies. There are, uh, I don't know how many species exactly, but it is known by dragonfly enthusiasts and scientists really all over as having incredible species. And that's really because of the clean water and the excellent habitat. Um, those, they, as they, because they live in the water for most of their lives, they have really strict sort of habitat needs. The water has to be a certain temperature and, you know, flow and all these things. And it just all comes together in the St. Croix. Um, another, uh, these, these are probably not as exciting as dragonflies. Uh, even experienced muscle scientists will tell you they pretty much look like rocks, um, sort of on the bottom, but they are actually really amazing creatures too. And these are the, the freshwater mussels or clams of the St. Croix. Um, this is an, a federally endangered species called the winged maple leaf. The St. Croix is the only river in the world where they reproduce. Um, they used to be much more widespread, but mussels are very sensitive to changes in water quality and things like that. And they've pretty much been driven out of many other rivers um, all over where they used to live. But because the St. Croix is protected and because it's so healthy and so clean um, it, that uh, the winged maple leaf hold, hangs on here and they still uh, reproduce um, up uh, pretty much near Interstate Park. Um, so next time if you're canoeing down the river up by Interstate, you are probably floating right over some really uh, endangered species, um, just kind of doing their thing on the river bottom. Um, a little bit more, this, this shows uh, all the Audubon designated uh, important bird areas in the watershed. Um, it's a, there's a ton of incredible habitat um, for birds. Uh, and it kind of shows some of the more interesting protected areas as well. And um, I'm guessing we've all seen some trumpeter swans in the area. They've made an amazing comeback in the last 20 years. Um, and now they are almost commonplace on the river. Um, pretty much during the winter, especially any little patch of open water, they'll stick around in. And sandhill cranes are another one that we uh, often see along the river um, and in the area. Um, wanna, again, <laughs> I keep saying my favorite this, my favorite that, but I really love sandhill cranes. You maybe have heard them flying over and they sound like dinosaurs croaking or something like that. Here's an osprey, um, awesome bird to see out there. They, of course, they are uh, fish eagles as they're also called. Um, I believe that they are, uh, somebody once measured how successful they are fishing and it's like they catch a fish every 12 minutes when they're hunting. Um, and that's pretty much way better than any human angler is <laughs> can ever hope for. They're, uh, they're very effective. Um, and here's a bald eagle, but also hanging out with his little buddy, the blue jay. I saw this up on the Namakagan River one day. I really couldn't understand what they were doing. They were kind of pretending like the other one wasn't there, um, as you can see. Uh, here's a blue flag iris on the Namakagan River. You'll see those in June, just uh, gorgeous flowers. And uh, I'm guessing we can all, we've all seen these. Um, a lot of beaver along the river. I actually don't see so many beavers. Um, I think that they uh, are often nocturnal around here, especially on, especially when the river's busy. Um, so you'll see their signs, these tree stumps as much as anything. Um, but just recently, this was my first float this year. I think we might've been the first people this little beaver family had seen since last fall. Um, we, were, we were out there pretty early and um, they seemed surprised, but they also didn't just jump in the water immediately like they usually do. Um, actually the young beaver you can see on the bank there, that's their, their little baby. Um, he was the one or he or she was the one that buggered out of there as quickly as possible while mom and dad, who look very dry, I think they had been basking in the sun there and enjoying some um, bark <laughs> um, for a while. They, they looked pretty comfortable. But they are really interesting creatures. They, uh, they do a lot for sort of changing the environment themselves with their dams and tree cutting and things like that. And also huge fish. Everybody loves to see huge fish, in my experience. Um, sturgeon are an amazing species that lives in the St. Croix. Uh, 
and uh, really the St. Croix has become a destination now for uh, fishing. It's mostly all catch and release, thankfully. And a lot of it actually takes place during the winter. Um, that's one of the best times uh, um, to go sturgeon fishing. Um, but recently, and I don't think I have that picture in here, but a couple of years ago, uh, the new world record, I think, for uh, fish uh, sturgeon was caught in the St. Croix. Uh, maybe it was just the Minnesota record at them, but um, another huge fish. Um, also musky, um, if anybody um, is aware, is familiar with those, an amazing uh, game fish uh, also that um, in a predator, um, you know, they're sort of the wolves of the water as uh, people will say. Um, and here's one that I just recently saw. These are commercial fishermen down at Point Douglas and Prescott. Um, every spring they put out nets and drag them in and they, they keep the rough fish um, as they're called. Um, for better or worse, um, but the, the and then they they sell them for um, food and other things. But they they also get a lot of the game fish and fish they're not allowed to keep. But they'll and they'll just bring those in the nets and then uh, throw them back. But this is a paddlefish, um, another very interesting species. You can see it has that big uh, kind of horn on the front, um, but absolutely <laughs> absolutely massive. I couldn't believe it when I saw that one. That's a it's a large specimen. Uh, okay, well, we'll get away from wildlife for a minute. I think I have some more animal photos later because I can't help it. Um, but this, uh, this is an archaeological dig along the St. Croix River near Marine on St. Croix, conducted by the Science Museum of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota. Um, and there have been several sites located along the river. The river was a, a highway, of course, for millennia. Um, there are sites that have been identified along the river going back about 6,000 years. So really, as soon as the glaciers receded around 12,000 years ago, people were moving into the area. Um, and they you know, spent thousands of years, of course, in the area hunting. Um, there were bison at the time and um, other, other creatures. And, uh, and this, at this site, it was, this was the Oneota people. Um, that's what we call them. We don't know what they called themselves. They were a, a society that existed before Europeans arrived. Um, probably sort of a, a predecessor of the Dakota people. Um, this was their northernmost known uh, village. Um, they were sort of a, a plains people as well. And this, like I said, this site is by Marine on St. Croix. Um, it's been known about for 50, 60 years. It's been excavated at various times. And um, what you get, what, what the, how you know it's Oneota is their pottery. Um, this is a little fragment of pottery that was made some 800 years ago and excavated at this site. Um, and, they, and you can see there's sort of grooves in it there. It might not look like much to us, but it looks like a lot to an archeologist. Um, for one thing, the grooves are what tell you partly who made it. They all, every kind of culture had their own decoration um, and, and patterns and things. And then the other really interesting thing, what the Oneota figured out was they could take the mussels out of the river and grind up the shells into almost a powder and mix that with their clay. And by doing that, it would make the clay much stronger so they could make much larger vessels with thinner walls. And so, I, I mean, I think that's really fascinating. Again, these mussels are still here. They're still really important. And people 800 years ago were using them as a resource and you know, really kind of developing a technology around them um, to make these, this pottery. This is um, a dog mandible. I had to think for a second also excavated at the site. This was a domestic dog that was part of this um, village apparently. Um, and uh, you know, here it was right in, right in the remains there. And that's a bear tooth. Again, these were actually both, I believe, found in either a refuse type pile or a old hearth. So they had either been burned or um, thrown away essentially. Um, but they would have eaten bear. Um, and that's, that's one of their teeth. And if, oh, um, and of course, uh, the Ojibwe people are still here. Um, there is uh, there are reservations uh, along the river. Uh, I guess one primary reservation by Danbury, Wisconsin. Um, but they still uh, are in the area, and um, they were the kind of primary tribe that was here uh, when Europeans arrived. Um, the Dakota people were active in the, sort of just the southern end of the river way, and there were of course some wars fought. The Ojibwe were sort of expanding into the. Um, Dakota's territory at the time and um, had some battles about that. Uh, but then, of course, Europeans arrived. Um, really, some of the first to uh, travel to St. Croix were in the early um, 19th century. 
Henry Schoolcraft uh, traveled the river in 1832. The riverway, the watershed essentially was opened to settlement and logging in 1837 with the uh, signing of treaties. Um, and then shortly after that, the first uh, settlements were, were created. Um, Marine on St. Croix being the first, 1838, the year after the treaties were signed and the region was opened up, uh, some folks from Illinois came up and staked a claim. And, uh, and this, uh, this is another one of my favorite spots, our Cola Mills, just off our Cola Trail north of Stillwater. This was a lumber village, essentially. There's a sawmill that still stands too. And this beautiful mansion that was built, completed in 1847. Um, and I do like to think, I mean, that's this quite a mansion and there was really not too many people around at the time. Um, it must have been quite a little outpost. And that's of course near the Arcola High Bridge. Uh, if any of you folks have seen that before, that crosses the river about five miles north of Stillwater. It was completed in 1911. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it's been compared to the Eiffel Tower. Um, this is not my best picture of it. It doesn't kind of show its sort of soaring grandeur, but it's, uh, and it's still in use, of course. It still sees a few trains a day. Um, again, this is the same year Arcola Mills, that mansion was completed here. Uh, Henry Lewis was an artist who traveled the area um, and he painted this painting of the Dells, essentially. Um, Dells area up by uh, Taylor's Falls and, and St. Croix Falls. And here's what Schoolcraft said. This is one of the earliest descriptions of the St. Croix that I've come across. This was 1832 and when he first set off, actually paddling up the St. Croix from Mississippi with a party. The waters are beautifully transparent and the margin exhibits a pebbly beach so cleanly washed that it would scarcely afford earth enough to stain the fairest shoe. So he found a very clear, um, clean river, not carrying much sediment um, and that kind of thing is what he's referring to, of course, with the earth to stain a shoe. Um, and that's because the watershed was heavily forested and, and covered in prairie that, uh, that held back any erosion. Gonna jump around a little bit here. This, of course, my, I think why we, well, many of us love the St. Croix is that it's just plain fun. Um, this is some of my family out there on the river. Um, my kids love the pontoon boat, but primarily as a vehicle to get to a beach where they are happy to spend an entire day playing, swimming. Um, I think it's a really important resource that you know, anybody can really enjoy. Um, wonder, this is the Namakagan actually, the um, wonderful paddling opportunities. There's my family. This is a couple of years old now. Um, they've grown up a bit since then, but um, canoeing on the river. Um, and then of course that great clean water, I think so many of us love, um, you know, a lot of people ask these days, you know, can you swim in this lake? Can you swim in this river? And, you know, you can, always, you can still swim in the St. Croix and not worry a bit about it, really. Um, and I think that's really special. And it supports all this wonderful wildlife. And yeah, <laughs> more wonderful wildlife. Um, just some more creatures. There's that pathonotary warbler again. Um, some river otters down there in the lower left. Uh, camping across those a couple of years ago. They are out there. They're even harder to see than beavers. I think I rarely um, come across them. They're pretty shy. Um, in the upper right, there's cardinal flower. That's one of my favorite flowers. In kind of late summer, it blooms in the floodplain areas. Um, absolute brilliant red um, that just is, is really awesome. And it uh, turns out ruby-throated hummingbirds as they head south in the fall. That's one of their great sources of energy is the pollen uh, or the nectar from the uh, from cardinal flower. And I've seen them, I've seen the, the hummingbirds headed down the river, you know, and then like stopping off at every cardinal flower to have a little sip. <laughs> um, more wonderful creatures to be seen around here. Um, the Carner blue butterfly is an endangered species of butterfly. Um, and there's an, a significant effort to restore its habitat. And especially in um, Northwestern Wisconsin, that kind of part of the watershed, it needs these, uh, it needs lupine. Uh, the flower lupine to uh, raise its young on where it lays its eggs um, just like monarchs only lay their eggs on milkweed. Carner blues need lupine so they're restoring a lot of that and trying to bring those back from the brink right along the river. And some more there's another osprey um, but really you just start to see that all these different plants and animals are very closely connected in, in one incredible ecosystem. Um, speaking of dragonflies, I mentioned that um, 
it's, you know, the St. Croix has an incredible population of unique dragonflies. It also has its very own dragonfly. This is the St. Croix snake tail. Um, this was discovered along the St. Croix River um, up by, uh, I guess, north of St. Croix Falls, essentially, in 1991. Um, and it, uh, since then, it has been discovered in a couple other rivers around the country, actually like Virginia, I think. And what that really says is, it, you know, it's widely spread, but it's only found in a couple places. And it's a, it's a dragonfly that only lives in sort of the cleanest um, rivers and fast moving rivers and that kind of thing. Um, and so really it used to probably exist from Minnesota to Virginia, um, but with European settlement and things like that and all the pollution, it was essentially driven out of many, most rivers. Um, but again, because it, the St. Croix is so clean and healthy, it held on here um, until scientists were able to identify it. And this photo was taken last year. They're still out there. Just a cool bird I've seen a few times along the river there. It's a Wilson snipe there. They shove that long beak down into muck and mud and um, get insects and things like that. Uh, another endangered species, uh, doesn't look like much, but this is called kitten tails. Blooms in June usually. Um, and it's sort of a species of really dry prairie. And really the St. Croix is sort of one, it's found in other places, but St. Croix Valley is one of its sort of holdouts, um, a lot of people would say, um, where it's just, it's fairly common. Not, I mean, it's still, it's not common, but it's more common, I guess, than it is in other, many, most other places. So sort of one of those cool species that I think kind of defines the St. Croix Valley. Uh, I don't know if anybody knew we had cactus in the area. Um, this is up pretty much in the Interstate Park in Wisconsin. Um, and it's, there's these areas of bedrock, essentially exposed bedrock, very thin soils and it, um, and they're sort of really sunny and exposed um, to, to warmth. So these prickly pear cactus grow there. Um, and by the way, when you're kneeling down to take a picture of prickly pear cactus, make sure you're not kneeling on a prickly pear cactus because those spikes will go right into your knee. Um, take it from me. Oh, here's some more cardinal flower. This is an awesome one where I just one day we came across basically a field of it growing on this island. All right, now we'll get a little bit into some of the doom and gloom, um, but I, don't, I hope it's not that way. I'm going to talk about some of the things that are being done to address problems as well after this. Um, but the, the St. Croix is healthy and clean and it's fragile. Um, it is a very sensitive waterway um, and can be easily sort of affected by human activities. What we see here, this is down, I believe, at the Kinnikinnick River um, State Park, and there's a big beach there. And this is a algae bloom um, that was uh, spotted one summer day. Um, and this is a type of algae that is um, can be quite harmful, actually, to people and animals. Um, it creates chemicals in the water that, um, you know, at, at the best, it might, if you actually got into it, it might um, make your skin itchy or something like that. But it's actually like a neurotoxin as well if you were to drink it or um, you know in a higher exposure it can be quite harmful it can hurt your kidneys and things like that um, and unfortunately it's uh, but dogs pet dogs have been sort of the biggest um, victim of it because they'll go swimming in waters uh, of course that we won't and um, I don't know but I've not heard about any on the St. Croix but elsewhere unfortunately pet dogs have died because of um, swimming in contaminated waters and really what's ca what causes these uh, blooms, they are a natural species, but they, when they, they get so out of control, they sort of explode like this where they just dominate everything in the water. Um, and that's really because they get too much nutrients. Um, and so that's like phosphorus and, um, and nitrogen for that matter um, that comes from erosion and fertilizer and things like that. When it gets into the river, it feeds these algae, which um, can cause a lot of problems. And here you can see the amount, this is uh, based on some research done here in the St. Croix Valley. This is the amount of phosphorus um, in the St. Croix River since before Europeans really started to affect the area. And as you can see, it really took a jump uh, kind of in that post-war era. And as agriculture and development really took off in the area, um, it uh, unfortunately started putting a lot more nutrients into the river. And so there are big efforts underway. Um, uh, significant efforts um, by both states and counties and watershed districts to start to work on reducing that that amount of phosphorus. Um, this map shows um, all the designated impaired waters in the watershed and like I was saying 
of course, um, the river is more than just the river. It's sort of the sum of its tributaries. Um, and so everything that happens in the watershed makes its way to the river. Um, don't pay too much attention to any differences between Minnesota and Wisconsin here because it's sort of how they measure things and designate things. Um, Minnesota, frankly, has assessed a lot more of its waters and measured them and, and tried to see if they're con uh, contaminated than Wisconsin has in this area. So there's more in Minnesota, that, but that might just be because they've been uh, detected better. Um, but as you can see, it's a widespread issue. And these can be anything from excess nutrients, like I was mentioning, phosphorus and things, or it can be mercury um, that gets into fish, makes that dangerous, um, or E. coli bacteria, which comes from livestock operations and failing septic systems on lakes and rivers. And so that, there's a few different ways that they can be impaired. Um, and then uh, again, invasive species are a big issue. This is a silver carp. Um, this is what would be called an Asian carp or an invasive carp. Um, that's been a threat for a while. Um, still not, doesn't seem to be overrunning the river yet, but in other places, uh, southern, um, kind of like the uh, in Illinois and those types of areas, some of their rivers have just been completely overrun by invasive carp. Um, this silver carp, this was the first one that was found in the St. Croix. There's a few different species. The silver carp is the one that jumps out of the water when motorboats go past it. Um, and there's videos that are just incredible that uh, people will be driving a boat down some other rivers and um, these fish will just be flying out of the water all over. Um, but, and so that's a, that's a nuisance and a threat. I mean, there are rivers where people just say almost every person who's boated on it says, I've either been injured by a flying carp or my boat has been damaged by one. Um, but also really they, they take over the ecosystem and they will, they're voracious, they, they grow quickly, they eat a lot and they will sort of outcompete other fish, native fish um, and uh, take over, you know, so that's so all of a sudden the, these carp will be the only fish species. Um, there's reason to hope with the St. Croix, there are efforts underway to sort of stop them from getting into the river, um, getting farther up the Mississippi River, which is where they come from. Um, and there's thoughts that the St. Croix just might not be great habitat for them. It might be too clean, <laughs> might be too healthy um, to really let them flourish because they sort of do, uh, do better in um, sort of warmer, dirtier <laughs> water. Um, but that's, that could be very well be a false hope. And there's, there, there's a large effort underway to try to control these things if possible. Um, another, this is, and I think somebody mentioned this earlier, this is a manure spill um, in a river a creek in the um, kind of in Wisconsin um, in the Willow River watershed. Uh, so this is east of Hudson essentially quite a ways, 20 miles. Um, and this was a, a dairy farm. A dairy, so these are called confined animal feeding operations and they're or otherwise known as factory farms. Um, they really are factories. They're not, they're not farms in any way shape or form. Um, they put a lot of animals in barns and um, pump them full of food and antibiotics and drugs and, um, and then ship them off to be slaughtered. And uh, much of it um, goes, to, especially the hogs, um, go to China, actually. Um, but this was two years ago about when manure from one of these, they create an amazing amount of manure in a very small area is the problem. And so then all that manure has to be disposed of. And they, what they do is they spread it on nearby farm fields and use it as fertilizer. But of course, unfortunately, often it's way too, way more than the field can actually absorb. This is what a CAFO looks like. Um, and so when that happens, and what happened was this was, it was like November and the ground was beginning to freeze and it was sort of raining when they did it. And um, they dumped a whole lot of manure on this field and it ran right off and down a ditch and into a creek. <clears throat> and uh, and unfortunately resulted in um, dead fish and um, uh, all sorts of bad um, ecological impacts, of course. As you can see, like I said, there's, there's no animals in sight. This is just a, a giant barns um, full of, and again, these, are, these can be dairy, um, which are really the only type that we have in the area right now. Um, but hogs have been really the big threat that has been identified. Um, there are now proposals and companies who are interested in opening up some hog CAFOs um, in Wisconsin um, near the Trade River primarily. Um, so this is again north of St. Croix Falls, maybe 20 miles, um, that area. And there's one proposal for a, a facility 
that would um, con uh, would be uh, sort of raising baby pigs, where then they would be sent off to other facilities to be raised um, to adulthood. Um, but it would have up to 26,000 hogs at the site um, all year long. And it would produce up to at least 9 million gallons of manure per year. And that would all have to be spread in the surrounding area. Um, and then, of course, there, that's sort of the one proposal. Um, but there are others that are expected to follow. Um, these things sort of, they create um, little uh, networks where you'll have different facilities for, like I said, for raising, um, you know, the farrowing, as they call it, bringing um, the baby hogs and then sending them off to a finishing facility and then a, a processing or slaughterhouse. And um, uh, so you really can get a lot of different facilities kind of concentrated in an area. Um, Iowa has been just decimated by these things. And, um, and of course, not only does it create a huge pollution issue, um, but it also drives almost all the family farms in the area out of business. They outcompete, they, they sell their products cheaper, they buy things on big contracts, and family farms just can't compete, uh, unfortunately. No, I'm sorry, this is again, these are the fish, some of the fish that were killed by that uh, incident in 2019. Um, there are a variety of minnow species. That actually was a trout stream designated that uh, it spilled into. Um, there were not any trout killed observed, but still you can see it just wreaks havoc on the ecosystem. All right, uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. I realize I've been talking for quite a while. Oh, I have been talking for quite a while. Uh, I'm gonna breeze through a little bit here um, and just talk a little bit about climate change. It was really an under um, discussed issue. Um, as you can see, this is the average flow going at, at St. Croix Falls of the St. Croix River. Um, and luckily they've been measuring flow up there for more than hundred years. And so we can see that in the last century, flow has increased a lot. And what flow does is then it creates a wider river, it erodes more, um, and there's more flooding. Um, and why is that, of course? It's because there's more precipitation primarily. <clears throat> there's about, we're getting about two inches more uh, rain every year in this area than, than historically, um, than we were about 100 years ago. Again, luckily, uh, there have been records kept for a long time. And also you can see the, the peak flows are getting bigger and that's like the biggest flood of every year is getting bigger. And again, those peak flows are especially what can carve a wider channel and, um, and, and sort of uh, erode the banks and things like that. And why is that, of course? It's because the atmosphere is getting warmer because carbon dioxide levels are climbing um, due to fossil fuel usage. And um, as a, war a warmer atmosphere can, can contain more water and uh, then uh, release more water, of course, too, in rain events. Um, and then the other reason that it's changed is because the, the watershed has changed. Um, this shows the, how, what sort of makes up the land in the watershed um, over the last uh, couple centuries. And uh, the forested areas have declined a lot and the prairie has declined a lot. And agriculture and developed areas have increased, of course. And um, those forests and prairies held back a lot of water, um, but the, um, a lot of agriculture and development just flushes that water right off very quickly. And that's why you get large, more water in the river, essentially. But, we're, but people are, like I said, taking big steps to try to solve some of these problems. Um, and this is a project that was just happening last year in Marine on St. Croix. There are many similar projects occurring up and down the river um, where this, is a, this was a gully that was eroding rapidly and um, it had increased flows and um, was destroying the kind of swamp at the bottom because all this sand was washing out and washing down the bluff and then it makes its way to the river eventually. And so this was a huge project um, but they, they essentially put a pipe down the bluff so that the water can be carried down without carving a deeper gully. And then they're going to plant it with native plants to hold all that soil in place. Um, this is a rain garden, this down in Lakeland. I don't know if anybody knows Sally Arneson, but she's been a great advocate. Down, yeah, <laughs> she's, she's terrific. She did a lot of this work just on her own time. Um, here's some farmers. This is in western Wisconsin. These folks are part of what's called the Horse Creek Watershed Farmer Led Watershed Council. Um, and they are, you know, often third generation, fourth generation farmers, and they are working together to identify practices that work right in their area to reduce uh, runoff and, and um, those types of things um, from agricultural lands. And uh, the guy on the left is with the county water um, office, I believe, and, you know, received a lot of support from the counties as well. 
and they're just experimenting and, and working with neighbors. They're great spokespeople because these are farmers. They can talk to other farmers and help them, you know, do what works essentially. Okay, and I will, I think this, I'm getting toward the end. This is St. Croix 360. Um, again, thanks for listening. And, you know, if really, this, I know that was a ton of information, um, but if you, if you wanted in a little bit more of a trickle, uh, you can sign up for the newsletter um, because every week I'm sharing information just like this presentation um, and it's news and it's essays about the river and it's um, all of the above. Um, as you can see, there's Walter Mondale. Um, that's this. That's our most recent um, article. But usually every every Friday afternoon, I send out a newsletter. It has usually three, four, or five articles in it. Um, and here's a few little recent highlights. Uh, you know, here was an essay about that first oh, first trip on the river this spring. Um, another issue has been this turtle harvesting. I'm you know I've been trying to keep people updated on efforts at the Capitol to. Uh, stop the commercial harvest of turtles. Um, on the left, uh, you can see some, this is about up in um, Lake Town Township. Uh, they've been, they're one of the uh, kind of target areas for CAFOs or factory farms and they're working um, to try to protect themselves. Uh, the new Eipel property park, I've been covering that for several uh, years now as they've uh, acquired that new parcel right in Stillwater on the river. And I just have to make a plug, of course, the St. Croix 360 is totally supported by its readers and by the community. And if uh, you enjoyed this presentation, I would very much appreciate your support. It's what allows me to, to keep doing it. And now, um, thank you. Like I said, I know that was a lot of information. I've been talking a lot and um, I didn't pause for any questions, but I would be happy to uh, get your thoughts, get your experiences with the river or any, obviously any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. That was that was awesome. Um, so I can see people better if we can maybe go out of the share screen. Yep. Yep. And then um, you don't have a, I was gonna say, I think I can have you guys kind of um, just unmute yourself and um, ask, raise your hand to ask a question. John. Yeah, a uh, question. Do, do, once this pandemic thing is over with, Will you guys have a uh, like a physical meeting like once a month or something where we could talk to people? No. Yeah, or just just yeah. just look at the newspaper. Yeah. Uh, are you talking about with three hundred and sixty? Yeah, so, uh, San Christ three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Do you guys I, meet? No, we don't. I don't. I don't really. I mean, I do presentations like this, and I've I've certainly thought about having some events. Oh, I also have to I should give a plug. I'm I'm leading uh, four guided kayak paddles out of the out of our Cola Mills this summer. You can find information about that on the website. Um, but no, I really pretty much focus on um, researching, reporting, and sharing the news. Um, media, yeah, you know, and it's certainly that the community has been a big part of it. I would you know always looking for ways to engage readers and and you know hear more from from folks. Uh, I definitely don't want it to be just a one way street. Sure. John, the other John. Go ahead and unmute, John. <laughs> You're muted. No. There you go. Okay. I, I have two questions. Uh, one is, how often does the St. Croix River flood? And uh, the second question is, how much regulations are there to kind of help balance between the real active sports such as water skiing in the quiet sports such as fishing, in terms of as the river gets busier and busier, how does that, are there regulations that help control that type of thing? Great, uh, two great questions. Um, flooding, it, of course, just depends and varies a lot year to year, I think, as anybody mm. who here knows. Um, <clears throat> one thing we've been seeing more of in recent years has been floods in the middle of summer, um, mm. instead of just the spring sort of runoff flooding. Um, we're seeing more floods that happen because of extreme rainstorms, which are another climate change impact. Um, and so we've seen huge, some of the biggest floods in the river's recorded history have happened in like July um, versus April um, when they might have previously happened. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's hard to say how frequently it floods. Um, you know, a couple years ago, they were building a dike in Stillwater and, you know, had um, forecast for a possibility of significant flooding. It really depends on a variety of factors like um, how much uh, the depth of the frost level in the watershed because if the ground is frozen the water runs off more how much snow of course we receive during the winter um, 
a lot of, you know, when these things hit sort of thing. Um, and then as far as regulation um, of, of especially around kind of recreational uses, you know, there's not a lot of it. There's a lot of uh, conflict, I would say. Uh, we've seen a little bit more, the river gets busier and busier and that creates conflicts. Um, uh, and one thing that's been uh, kind of an emerging problem has been the wake boats, especially on the lower river. Um, people mm -hmm. with these boats that are meant for wake surfing where they tow somebody behind them and they surf on the wake. They actually have these, they've designed these boats now to just create massive wakes. And uh, that can be really disruptive, of course, to other users, as well as causing erosion and things like that on the shoreline. Um, so, and I would just say there's not a lot of regulation. There is supposed to be more regulation. Uh, back in around two, 2000, there was an effort to sort of dictate what, essentially the lower St. Croix from St. Croix Falls down um, was sort of divided into three zones. And from St. Croix Falls to the high bridge, essentially, was supposed to be really it was, it was agreed that it would be sort of quiet water, slow, no wake sort of thing, um, fishing back, you know, really a peaceful sort of experience. Um, from the high bridge to still water was sort of an intermediate zone. And then the lower river was intended for kind of active recreation. Um, and unfortunately, um, that, those, those more restricted zones are almost never enforced these days. And the wakes have been getting bigger and the speeding on the, up, on the upper river has gotten bigger. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely some conflicts and the the regulation it's been tough to keep up with and the enforcement of it. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, I thought those regulations that you were talking about were, I guess, really firm. Mm -hmm. And evidently, maybe if you don't have people watching, yeah. it's okay. Well, and I think, you know, one of the issues was they weren't defined very well. You know, this was sort of this management plan and it sort of said, well, it didn't say no way, you know, it just sort of said, eh, you know, kind of be respectful and all it's in any way then for like any kind of water patrol sheriff or otherwise, it's hard for them to sort of know what's right and what's wrong. And they're sort of differing ideas about what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, but really, you know, the, the regulations on the banks, you know, development, building houses and things, that's been a hot topic over the years because um and that's more enforced and a little um but the development has you know along the river to keep the banks sort of wild and all that has been uh, there's more enforcement of that at least thank you anyone else i think it's kind of fun um the special creatures that exist here we were part of a program that's um that was in Wisconsin when they were talking about that new dragonfly and we just felt like newborn parents. It was so much fun. Yay, St. Croix River. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I just think, you know, people, people, you can go to Africa and see amazing wildlife or South America, but you can, I mean, it, it, the, the St. Croix is incredible for, mm -hmm. for it as well. You know? and, and I, think I, made, <laughs> I think I've said no. So. Your pictures were astounding. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. So John again. John, you want to unmute? Yep. Yeah, there you go. Uh, is there any word on what's happening with that um, park just north of downtown Stillwater? Yeah, I, I, I the, just touched on very briefly on it. Yep. You know, it's open now. You can go in there. Um, but the development, they've just approved a master plan for it in the last few months. And um, I think the kind of the park development things will start actually this year. I think that they wanted to get it done and they're gonna start really with the easy, like sort of like, let's make this accessible to people, you know, figure out parking and that kind of thing this year. So really you should start seeing it a little more, you know, soon. So do you know, are they doing any kind of um, educational signage at all in the mm -hmm. park? As far I, I know, as, you know, I, like conservation I, and stuff? I, I don't know exactly. Um, I think there'll be a little bit of that, but I think it hasn't been developed or finalized yet as far as what it'll be. That would be really yeah. great to, to see is because oh. a lot of a lot of things happen because people don't know any better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a you know one there's a one of the great blue heron rookeries is near that park actually. And I thought, you know, what an awesome opportunity to be able to see those birds. Um, mm -hmm right there, right from the park and all that. And then, you know, that's the kind of thing I think in Rochester right now, there's a big development that's gonna wipe out a great blue heron rookery and it's been, yeah, a, yeah. You know, been a, a controversial issue, but 
again, like you're, like you're saying, Penny, you know, if people don't know that that rookery is there and how special it is, then things, you know, it doesn't get protected. Yeah. Right. John, the other John. Yeah. How far north of uh, Stillwater is this new park? Oh, that's, it's right in Stillwater, actually. It's, um, you know, where the Zephyr Theater is and the former railroad yeah, depot yes. there? It's basically directly north of there. And it's almost a quarter mile of shoreline, I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, there's a house on the property and a driveway. Okay. Um, you've, you've probably seen it. It's right off. It's kind of sandwiched between the Browns Creek Trail, 95, and the river. Yeah. I was, yeah really, okay. I was really disappointed in the name of the new park after I read your post yeah. with your yeah. suggestions, which well, were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm assuming that ship has sailed. You know, I, that's a good question. I've, I've actually been in contact with a couple people in Stillwater who are trying to um, come up with some better names and then push the city council to change that decision. You know, I- um, you Drop me an email if you want to get connected with those folks. I think we could use a little push because yeah, it's- what, What's the name of it? It's going to be Lumberjack Landing. Oh. Yeah, just kind and, of- and some, of, some of Greg's suggestions honored the Native American heritage. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I had complained, I've complained to our mayor about that name, Yeah. you know, cause it was sort of his deal. Like mm -hmm. it came up in city council yeah. and, you know, he's sort of dismissed it, you know, talked about our history, lumbering, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I'm very disappointed too. And I would be glad to be part of a group, Greg, if you want to post yeah. that or something. <laughs> yep. sure. sure thing. Yeah, I think it could use that. I, 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 I would hope that that can be fixed because I yeah think, me too yeah you know, I just don't think Stillwater needs to be like a logging era theme park you know that's just right kind of that's right personal well that it's been covered <laughs> yeah, <it's just> <laughs> <laughs> good, good yeah. point yeah it's just another one of those things where we need to to honor those that were here yeah you know, not, not necessarily those of us who took over yeah I mean this kind of like I say you know the human history in the area is six, 8,000 years at least, mm -hmm. and, you know, so Stillwater, the city and the people, all of us, of course, and our ancestors, we're just a blip, you know, in this area's history so far. Do you have resources you recommend for those of us who want to know more about that history? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, mm. That's a, You know, I don't, I, nothing off the top of my head, but let me think about that one a little okay. bit. Um, you know, it's been one of those things, and, you know, even I've had a little second uh, second or some doubts about coming up with my names for that park. Uh, I've always been very cautious. I don't want to sort of speak for native people, you know, or sort of, um, you know, and so like, I've kind of thought if there needs to be, a, if there's going to be a native name that there needs to be native involvement too. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I guess I, I love telling the stories about um, the people and the native people, but I'm, I try to be very careful about speaking about things I don't know about, you know, <laughs> and I'm not uh, qualified. So, um, Anyway, I, I, there are resources. I just, I, I got to think a little bit. So maybe I can do a little follow-up email with some. Um, some yeah, good stuff. Jeff. Yeah. I think, uh, Marilee, there's a National Park Service uh, facility in St. Croix Falls that uh, Greg referred to. And it's a good place to visit. And there's also uh, like a Friends of the St. Croix um, organization. It's, a, I think, also a volunteer-run organization. And that's I believe that's the St. Croix Falls too, or maybe Osceola, I can't remember. That would be, that's the St. Croix River Association. That's um, right. Yeah, and they, yeah. they're based in St. Croix Falls. I meant to give them a plug. They've been partners of mine over the years. And yeah. you know, I'm more of a storyteller and journalist and writer and all that. They are the real advocacy group who you know is um, in the halls of power and all that sort of thing. So by all means, look up the St. Croix River Association. Um, and they are actually a staffed organization now. They were volunteer run forever, but they've grown in the last 10 years or so into a uh -huh. significant group. Also, if you check the um, Conversations in the Valley group, they had a, a Native American woman speak on the St. Croix this year. And yep. it was video, you know, it was a Zoom, so you can access that. So that might be another. Yeah, that's not a. St. Croix Valley Foundation. I think if you get to their website, you'll find yeah. conversations of the valley. And I've, I've seen that, that recorded presentation about Dakota people. Yeah. So it was because it was this area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was very good. So that's another, another spot that um, might be of interest. And maybe some of this, I was going to say, if you get some of these resources um, 
to us, we could mm -hmm. maybe get some of that in our um, Trinity newsletter. Well, that'd be great. Yep. To, to share that information for people as another way of um, learning more about the history. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I was going to say we could go on and on, I'm sure. Um, but it is 12 after 12 already. So to be to be honoring of people's time, um, I just want to thank you so much, Greg. This was just awesome. Great. Yeah, Great so information I and um, just <laughs> a reminder of what a, a wonderful, beautiful place we have here and how we mm -hmm. need to care for it and treasure it too. Mm -hmm. so, Amen. Um, yeah, thank you yeah. so much again. And thank we you. really appreciate it. Sheila, thank you for bringing Greg to us today. This was, this was great. Um, and as far as next week, we are in May. We'll have four more adult forums left and we're gonna end off with um, looking at um, theologies of atonement. And um, we're gonna follow the study of, um, of David Lose's making sense of the cross for mm. those of you who who find lent difficult you might really like this study to try to make sense of the the, the cross and um just where we all go from there um you can purchase a book if you want it's most certainly not necessary but trinity has purchased a number of books um so less than what you would have to pay if you got it on amazon for 10 bucks you can pick it up at the church nine to five, Monday through Thursday or on Sunday. Like I said, you don't need to buy it to get a lot out of our sessions, but you are most welcome to. We aren't going to cover all of the chapters, but all of the, all of the key stuff is going to be covered. So um, just have that for you there. And I did send out an email. Hopefully people got that as well. So any other questions of me before we close out today or pastor peter you have anything else to say no right. really good really good thanks greg thanks, yeah thank greg. you so much greg it was thank you thank you wonderful it was really fun great audience thank you all right and you folks have a wonderful week and thank you as always for coming take care